Hello ladies and gentlemen and a very warm welcome to Evolving Consciousness. I am your host Purushottam and in today's video we are going to continue with the series which we started a couple of days back on this phenomenal book called As a Man Thinketh by James Allen. And the central theme of today's video is the effect of thoughts on the aspect of achievement. Thought factor in achievement is the title of that particular chapter which we are going to go through and sort of unravel the true secrets of lasting achievement either in the material dimension or in the spiritual plane. So without wasting any time, let's dig deep into this wisdom, into this understanding which James has served so prolifically in this phenomenal book called As a Man Thinketh by James Allen. Now let's go deep into this particular chapter where he talks about the thought factor in achievement. Now he has started this particular chapter with a sort of a short snippet of a quote which says all achievements whether in the business, intellectual or spiritual world are the result of definitely directed thought are governed by the same law and are of the same method. The only difference lies in the object of attainment. So basically what he is trying to say is whether there is any kind of achievement whether it be in your material dimension, your career, your business, your relationships or in the spiritual plane, essentially the root causes, the root principles are essentially the same. Only the object of attainment is different. Meaning the foundational principles, the foundational aligning thoughts which sort of propel this sense of achievement, which sort of magnetize achievement in your day to day life, the foundational principles are the same whether it is the material dimension or the spiritual dimension. Now let's see what James is trying to talk about in this particular chapter. All that a man achieves and all that he fails to achieve is the direct result of his own thoughts. In a justly ordered universe where loss of equipoise or equilibrium would mean total destruction. Individual responsibility must be absolute. Now I was reading this beautiful quote on uh, the aspect of gratitude as to how grateful we need to be to nature in general. Because let's understand the cosmic coincidence in which you and me survive in. Every dimension of the way the planets are aligned, the way the atmospheric regulation, the atmospheric gases, the different layers of our stratosphere are so designed that even an inch of that, if it is moved here and there, the entire humanity would collapse. Essentially, what I am trying to portray as showcase here is that universe, the cosmic intelligence is so magnanimous and so intelligent that such clever calibration and such clever alignment is there in such a perfectly equipoised environment we survive and life nourishes in such a beautifully equilibrium environment which sort of houses this equilibrium and a sense of equanimity. Now we all need to be grateful for mother nature because let's understand how intricate and how carefully every aspect of this universe is designed so that we can easily and happily survive. Now coming back to this particular concept, right? He says a man's weakness and strength, purity and impurity are his own and not another man's. They are brought about by himself and not by another and they can only be altered by himself, never by another. His condition is also his own and not another man's. His suffering and his happiness are evolved from within. As he thinks, so he is. As he continues to think, so he remains. Gautam Buddha put it so well. He said, you become what you keep thinking. Right? Now the very funny thing and a very amusing and an interesting aspect of this thought, right? Normally what we think is that if I am thinking about someone negative but I am thinking good about myself, I am going to sort of be immune to that negative thought. But I was reading this book called The Power of Subconscious Mind by Dr. Joseph Murphy and he said that a hateful and a resentful thought it's not going to affect the other person, but it acts like a mental poison for yourself. So essentially, when you harbor negativity, you are actually not harboring negativity towards yourself. Since that negativity or that negative thought is created in your mental canopy, you are the person who is going to get affected. 
So essentially, you are hating yourself when you think bad about someone. Now, this is a very interesting and enlightening concept. We normally think that if I think good about myself and I think ill about others, that's okay. But Dr. Joseph Murphy says that's not okay. Essentially, this is a beautiful concept which I can also draw a parallel from the Advaita philosophy which says that essentially we are not separate. You might seem separate from a gross physical sense, but essentially we are all made up of the same consciousness. Hence, when you think good about others, you are essentially are thinking good about yourself. And when you think bad about others, you are essentially creating disturbance in your own consciousness. So it's very important to not have this classifications as to thinking good about ourselves and thinking ill about others. Because let's remember, where is that ill thought being created? It's in your own consciousness. And it's not going to serve you. In fact, to the contrary, it's going to harm you. Now, let's say what James says further on. He says, a strong man cannot help a weaker unless that weaker is willing to be helped. And even then, the weak man must become strong of himself. He must, by his own efforts, develop the strength which he admires in another. None but himself can alter his condition. Now, James is trying to say that a person who is weak, right? Firstly, there are two dimensions he's trying to touch here by this particular paragraph. He's saying that only a strong man can, weak, uh, can sort of help a weak person. Now, a strong man can mean so many different ways. A beggar cannot help another beggar. Now, beggar necessarily doesn't mean from a wealth standpoint. You can be a beggar from knowledge standpoint. You can be a beggar from a standpoint of wisdom. You cannot expect help from a person who himself is deprived of knowledge and wisdom. You cannot expect maturity from a person who himself is immature. So essentially, when he talks about strong versus me, a person, sort of helping a weak person, he's saying that only if you are yourself competent can you be of service to a person who is weak. Now the second point he's trying to say is, unless a weak person allows himself to be helped, only then can he be helped. Now it's not a fact that a strong man can always help a weak person. What if that weak person is not willing to get the help? Right? Now, this is a very interesting thing. Now, we all read good books and videos and we are exposed to the knowledge. But there might be few of us who are skeptical to the knowledge, who make fun of the knowledge. Because I know countless people who make fun of the Bhagavad Gita, the Srimad Bhagavad Gita, the highest level of spiritual knowledge which was ever spoken, which was ever given to mankind. There are people who make fun of it. So essentially, they are showcasing the weakness of their intellect when they make fun of it, right? So even though the Bhagavad Gita was having a universal message, it wanted to help every person to come out of their weakness. But there are certain weak people who are so immersed in the ocean of ignorance that Bhagavad Gita seems funny to them. Bhagavad Gita is a source of amusement to them. Now, these people are so blinded in their own well, in their own schools of thought, that they don't even know that they are weak, right? Essentially, it's a very uh, disappointing and a very awful state to be in. If, if you are someone who is aware of his weaknesses, if you are someone who is aware of your particular weaknesses and not so good points, at least you will be willing to make change. But if someone is not even knowing that he is in a sense of ignorance, he is already submerged in a sense of ignorance. The person will always be ignorant to the fact that he probably is not so mature. He probably doesn't even know that he is weak. Now, let me give you a very gross example to sort of uh, epitomize a sort of concretize your understanding of this concept. Now, if you go to a mental asylum, right, and you tell those people out there that you people are lunatic, nobody is going to agree to that. Because essentially, people who are lunatic never think they are lunatic. Now, this is a condition with most of us. They think they are sort of very elevated. 
and they make fun of the Srimad Bhagavad Gita, now, which is sort of considered to be the preamble of leadership and management and life management in general. But these people don't even know that they are weak, right? They don't have uh, intellect so magnanimous to comprehend the knowledge which has been given in that book. Now, let's go further as to what James is talking about. It has been usual for men to think and to say, many men are slaves because one is an oppressor. Let us hate the oppressor. Now, however, there is amongst an increasing few a tendency to reverse this judgment and to say, one man is an oppressor because many are slaves. Let us despise the slaves. The truth is that oppressor and slave are cooperators in ignorance and while seeming to afflict each other are in reality afflicting themselves. Now he says something beautiful here. Most of us have this victim mindset. They said I was oppressed, I was abused and all these kind of schools of thoughts, right? But essentially what he's saying is an oppressor cannot exist unless a person chooses to be oppressed as gets slave, gets uh, call, call himself a slave unless a person chooses to call himself a slave the identity of oppressor is not established. An oppressor can only exist if someone allowed himself to be a slave. So it's ignorance to only abuse the oppressor because the person who was considering himself as a slave, thought himself as a slave, thought the other person as an oppressor. But there's a policy and there's also a code dependency in this relationship. One cannot exist without the another. Slave cannot exist without an oppressor. An oppressor cannot exist without a slave. And he says that a perfect knowledge perceives the action of law in the weakness of the oppressed and the misapplied power of the oppressor. A perfect love, seeing the suffering which both states entail, condemns neither. A perfect compassion embraces both oppressor and oppressed. Now the person who has a sort of equanimity in his mindset, who can see things as they are, he will have eyes of compassion both for the oppressor and the oppressed. He will not give sympathy to the oppressed and he will not hate the oppressor. Instead, he will view them through the lens of compassion. He who has conquered weakness and has put away all selfish thoughts belongs neither to oppressor nor oppressed. He is free. A man can only rise conquer and achieve by lifting up his thoughts. He can only remain weak and abject and miserable by refusing to lift his thoughts. Now he basically is saying that if unless we are willing to give up the unselfish thoughts, the selfish thoughts, he can either belong to the oppressor or oppressed. Meaning when he talks about selfish thoughts, right, we all are clinging to an identity. You cannot be an oppressed person if your identity is different. So basically, you are sort of sacrificing the selfishness which sort of you are clinging to, right? The selfishness of your own respect. Because this victim identity gives pleasure to people. Because it gives them justification to attack the person who they claim to be an oppressor. Now, this is a very deep and subtle point which I am talking about here. A person who calls himself oppressed, a person who calls himself a victim, he derives satisfaction and he derives tremendous amount of justification as to why he always needs to condemn the oppressor. So, James is talking about when you completely disregard or completely have a neutral standpoint, a viewpoint towards that identity. Or in other words, you give up those selfish thoughts pertaining to your identity, you are free. A man can only rise, conquer and achieve by lifting up his thoughts. He can only remain weak and abject and miserable by refusing to lift up his thoughts. And there is one line which he says in black bold, right? He says it in bold letters. There is no progress without sacrifice. Before a man can achieve anything, even in worldly things, he must lift his thoughts above slavish extreme self-indulgence, which is also, which he also calls it as animal indulgence, he may not in order to succeed give up on animality and selfishness by any means, but a portion of it must at least be sacrificed. A man whose first thought is bestial indulgence could neither think clearly nor plan methodically. He could not find and develop his latent resources and would fail in any undertaking. 
not having commenced to manfully control his thoughts, is not in a position to control affairs and to adopt serious responsibilities. So basically he is saying that we all need to have a certain level of sacrifice when it comes to our base needs, when it comes to our animal indulgences. And the, he says that the short path or the shortcut to destruction, catastrophe and failure is overindulgence in bestial tendencies. Now this is so beautiful that even in the Srimad Bhagavad Gita, Lord Krishna talked about the three gates to hell. And number one gate was lust in that, right? Now lust doesn't always mean sexual fantasies. Lust can mean an excessive desire for certain objects, certain external objects. And he says that if a person is so obsessed about a certain thing, he fails to plan methodically and he could not then develop his latent resources. Meaning he is not able to refine or hone his latent talents. He is not fit to act independently and stand alone. He is not in a position to control affairs and adopt serious responsibilities. That famous dialogue from the movie Spider-Man which says, with great power comes great responsibilities. Now funnily enough, great power only gravitates to the person who is deserving to handle great responsibilities. There can be no progress, no achievement without sacrifice and a man's worldly success will be in the measure that he sacrifices his confused animal thoughts and fixes his mind on the development of his plans and the strengthening of his resolution and self-reliance. And the higher he lifts his thoughts, the more manly, upright and righteous he becomes, the greater will be his success, the more blessed and enduring will be his achievements. The universe does not favor the greedy, the dishonest, the vicious, although on the mere surface it may sometimes appear to do so. It helps the honest, the magnanimous, the virtuous. All the great teachers of the ages have declared this in varying forms. And to prove and know it a man has but to persist in making himself more and more virtuous by lifting up his thoughts. Now, this is this is a no-brainer. It can be understood by anyone that anyone who has achieved anything, be it small to big, he would have in some point of time understood the importance of sacrifice. Now, recently, uh, one of my colleagues did see uh, my iPhone 14 Pro Max, which is probably the latest version of the iPhone available and it costs about 2.5 lakhs. My parents gifted me that iPhone. Uh, the reason I'm telling you this is because my parents are completely self-made individuals. With the grace of God, we are in a beautiful space from an abundance standpoint, a financial standpoint. And that colleague of mine, he was saying that people travel to Dubai and United States to get a sort of a temporary discount on the iPhone. But my parents didn't have to do that. They could afford the iPhone, the latest version of iPhone in India. I didn't have to be dependent on the gifts of relatives. Now the reason I'm telling all this is, my parents sacrificed immensely during my growing up days. And because of that, I have, I enjoy a life of luxury. I'm truly grateful to the divine and to the immense sacrifices which my parents have done. And they always inspire me and they have showcased me through their own life how powerful the power of sacrifice is. And if you see any person, be it in from an ordinary walk of life or be it a legend, you will see the person, people see success but people don't see those endless sacrifices, those endless chain of sacrifices that person, that legend has done to achieve what he has today. We can always envy people, right? We envy their achievements. But what we fail to acknowledge is the person who has achieved so many things which are substantial, nobody sees the amount of sacrifice, effort and the great perseverance which that person has showcased over such a long period of time. And the world was busy enjoying. This person was working extremely hard, excruciatingly hard to refine his skill and to make those right sacrifices so that he could create abundant future. So James is emphasizing this power, emphasizing this point on having 
this tendency to sort of give up those bestial tendencies. Now, bestial tendencies can also be as simple as giving up laziness, giving up the quality of procrastination. He says you rise or fall by your thoughts, intellectual achievements are the result of thought consecrated to the search for knowledge, are for the beautiful and true in life and nature. Such achievements may be sometimes connected with vanity and ambition, but they are not the outcome of those characteristics. They are the natural outgrowth of long and odious effort and of pure and unselfish thoughts. Spiritual achievements are the consumptions of holy aspirations. He who lives constantly in the conception of noble and lofty thoughts, who dwells upon all that is pure and unselfish, will as surely as the sun reaches its zenith and the moon its full, become wise and noble in character and rise into a position of influence and blessedness. Now, it's a very beautiful concept that James is talking about. Even if some people who have done immensely well in the spiritual dimension, be it the likes of Swami Vivekananda, be it the likes of all great spiritual gurus of today's generation, right? Now, we all need to be mindful of not painting everyone with the same brush. Not every spiritual guru is a fake guru. They are people of substance out there. These people have sort of devoted themselves, have made the right sacrifices and sort of consumed themselves, their consciousness in elevating and pure thoughts. As a result of that, the whole world revels them. As a result of that, they rise to a position of influence and blessedness. Achievement of whatever kind is the crown of effort, the diadem of thought. By the aid of self-control, resolution, purity, righteousness and well-directed thought, a man ascends by the aid of animality, indolence, impurity, corruption and confusion of thought, a man descends. A man may rise to high success in the world and even to lofty altitudes in the spiritual realm and again descend to weakness and wretchedness by allowing arrogant, selfish and corrupt thoughts to take possession of him. Now this is a very beautiful point that James is saying that everybody can become successful, right? Everybody can become successful in some point of their life. But what is difficult is to maintain that success, to not allow arrogance fall in your consciousness and you become corrupted by your own sense of self-importance, uh, right? When you become successful at a reasonable level, we need to be mindful of not getting too much obsessed with that and not cultivate a sense of arrogance. In one of the shows which Shah Rukh Khan hosted uh, probably a decade back, one of the fans told something very significant to him. She said that, I have seen people who have been successful, but I have never seen someone handle success the way you have. So essentially, being successful is not the end game, but to maintain that success for a consistent period of time, be it any dimension of your life, that is the measure of true success. And he says that we always need to be mindful and watchful of this activity. This also reminds me of a very short excerpt which Sandeep Maheshwari talked about in his recent uh, video. He, so when Sandeep Maheshwari started off in YouTube, there were a couple of things which made him very famous, right? There was this concept of chewing the food 32 times before you gulp it in. And he said, does it, and someone in the audience said, does he follow the same thing even now? And he said, there are times when I slip. There are times when I fail to follow that but I immediately become mindful of that and I am back to track. Because this is a lifelong journey. If someone is expecting that if he reads something and he sort of becomes completely unaware, it's not going to work out. You always need to be mindful and observant of your behavior 24-7 for the rest of your life. If you, always have, if you wish to remain successful in that arena at that dimension, so habits are like that. Even once you have built those habits, it becomes easier to cultivate them and easier to sort of exercise them. But one needs to still be mindful and not slip into the old tendencies, old habitual patterns. Victories attained by right thought can only be maintained by watchfulness. Many gave way when success is assured and rapidly fell back into failure. All achievements, whether in the business, intellectual, spiritual world, are the result of definitely directed thought, are governed by the same law and are of the same method. The only difference lies in the object of attainment. He who would accomplish little must sacrifice little. He who would achieve much must sacrifice much. 
he would attain high sacrifice grade. Now, the degree to which you can achieve in life is directly proportional to the degree of things you sacrifice. Now, this is so clear and so simple to digest. But the pain which we have to endure in that sacrifice, the price for that is that huge achievement. Hope my today's video was of value to you. Hope you really understood the true essence of the thought factor in achievement. Thank you so much for your time on my video. I'm sincerely grateful for your time on your video. If you really loved my video, don't forget to like, share. Also, don't forget to subscribe to my channel if you really are enjoying the genre of the content which I am creating on my channel. Thank you so much and meet you in the next video.